Welcome to the Global Business Women's Pod, hosted by the Greater Houston Women's Chamber of Commerce. I am Susan Dyson and extremely excited to be your podcast host. In my day job, I am proud to be the CEO, president, and founder of the Chamber. Every Thursday at 6 p.m., we will bring you inspiring stories of women who are leading in the advancement of women and girls. We will take you with us to our premier events. You will meet entrepreneurs, executives, and philanthropists who will empower and inspire you to succeed. So please mark your calendars and join us for the Empowering Global Business Women's Pod. Thursday at 6 p.m. Please welcome to the stage the First Lady of Iceland, Eliza Reed, author of Secrets of the Spikar. What a pleasure to be with you here today on my very first trip to Houston in my life. <laughs> and my first time in Texas in more than 25 years. So thank you so much for inviting me to say a few words with you here today. My name is Eliza. I'm married to the president of Iceland, which makes me the first lady. And earlier this year in February, I published my first book called Secrets of the Sprakar, Iceland's Extraordinary Women and How They Are Changing the World. And so this afternoon, I thought that I would share a few words of wisdom with you um, about what these secrets of the Sprakar are and indeed what Sprakar at all are but I'll give you a bit of a teaser there. You saw a whole lot of them just a few minutes ago up on the stage. I was told there was a timer, by the way, for my speech. Someone can start it, otherwise I'll talk forever and you'll all get bored. Okay, you'll yell at me if I talk too much. This is also, you, I'm holding this piece of paper because this is my first stop on my in-person book tour and I've been doing all these virtual events so everything's um, printed for you. Let's see how this works. I wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction first on myself because my book is also a little bit of a memoir. So you already know that I'm first lady of the country, but I uh, grew up on a farm in Canada. That's why my accent sounds the way that it sounds for you. Um, studied at the University of Toronto. Didn't know what I wanted to do with life went to graduate school at the University of Oxford in England, where I kind of contrived to win a date with an Icelandic man, who was the only man from Iceland who was studying there. Um, Goodney Johannesson, that's us in the last century. So we fell in love, we moved together to Iceland almost 20 years ago. I became an entrepreneur and freelance writer and started an annual writing event called the Iceland Writers Retreat there. My husband and I had four children together in just under six years. I don't know if anyone else has taken photos like this because it's not possible to have a photo where everybody is smiling. We moved into this cute little thousand square foot house in Iceland and thought that this was gonna be this great life. And then my husband ran for president in 2016. Uh, he's a history professor by training and no political background. And, um, and I became first lady. And you, you can read in the book about how that happened, but in a nutshell, it happened in, in about the span of five weeks. Uh, it's a small country, so we don't have long campaigns there. And the, the, the role of the president is, is not such a political one. It's a unifying figure. So we also have a prime minister in Iceland who is a member of a political party. My husband is not a member of a political party. He has veto power over laws, but is essentially, um, yes, more, more of a unifying f figure throughout the country. And now, So I'm also going to introduce Iceland for you just a little bit here. Has anyone been to the country of Iceland? W one person, two, three, four... Okay, you all need to be going soon. But anyway, aside from that, uh, Iceland is a country in the North Atlantic, kind of near Greenland. We have a population that is getting close to the size of the number of people in this room. It's uh, 350,000 people, so it's a tiny country, um, but it's its own country. It's the world's third most happiest country. It is the world's most open country to the LGBTQI community. It is the world's most peaceful country. And for the past 12 years, according to the World Economic Forum, it is the best country in the world to be a woman. 
because it's closest to closing the gender gap between men and women. And the photo of me there is a photo of me with a woman named Vigdis Finnbogadottir, who was the world's first female president. And she served as president of Iceland from 1980 to 1996. So an entire generation of people around my age grew up with a woman as president. So the boys would grow up and say, I'd like to be president when I'm older, but can boys be presidents? And, and that's really what my book, Secrets of the Sprakar, is, is all about. Sprakar is an old Icelandic word that means extraordinary women. And uh, it's a word I think that we should be introducing into, into the English language as well. But it's about how the women of Iceland are changing the world by bringing gender equality within reach. And it's really what I'm going to talk to you today about. In my book, I spoke to dozens of women around the country not the first female president or the first lesbian prime minister or the first woman to climb Everest, but really people who are just living everyday lives and, and following their dreams and talk to them about the good things and the bad things about living in quote unquote, the world's best country for women with the idea that hopefully, you, you know, we can inspire all of you to help bring our planet closer to, to gender equality, which as I know all of you know here, is something that is beneficial for everyone, not just for women. So what I'm gonna do is cover a few topics um, where as a society in Iceland, we're pushing for greater equality. Uh, a few topics where sort of both legislation and individual pressure are, are working in harmony to achieve our goals. And then somewhere really it's down to us individuals to make all of the difference. And then I'll tell you how I made the most of that strange, unexpected opportunity of becoming married to a head of state back in 2016. So these are, the, these are a few points here of what Icelandic society, really, this sort of top-down approach is doing to help benefit um, gender equality. I'm going to put all the pictures up first. First one I have, Helping Parents Helps Us All. There's a photo of my husband, Topless. I don't know if he knows that it's there. Um, on when he took his paternity leave with our, I think that's our, yes, our second son. Um, Iceland, uh, the Icelandic government provides excellent uh, parental leave policy. And the interesting thing about that is that it's what's called a use it or lose it system, which means that one parent uh, gets five months of paid leave, the second parent gets five months of paid leave, and then there's a third number of months that you can split between you. The idea being that if, say, a father doesn't want to take parental leave, that leave just is lost and doesn't go to anybody. And once that leave is finished, then the subsidized childcare takes over. And if you were like me and had many children close together, you get all these discounts, sibling discounts from the community. So it gets cheaper and cheaper to, um, to do that. And, and that obviously means that a lot of women return to the workforce. So Iceland has the highest number of women uh, in the OECD countries taking part in the workforce. Claiming the corporate purse strings is a chapter I talk about in my book about money, something um, I think of great interest the, the, the Icelandic, uh, the Icelandic Chamber of Commerce, you see, I'm so used to speaking to groups in Iceland, to any chambers of commerce. I interview a woman called Fita Bulibde, who you see there. She is an immigrant from Palestine who started her own business and talks a lot about the experience of being an immigrant entrepreneur in Iceland, how that can be an advantage and a disadvantage. An interesting thing when it comes to the uh, the, the government policies there, though, is that Iceland also has a law of quotas on the boards of publicly traded companies, as well as a law that companies of a certain size have to prove that they are providing equal pay for, uh, for equal work. Um, nevertheless, out of, when I wrote the book, out of all the companies traded on the Icelandic Stock Exchange, zero were run by women. So it's an area that we really need to be improving in Iceland. And uh, leaving no one behind is, again, a message about the importance of making sure that as we work towards greater equality, we um, are uh, cognizant that we don't forget or, or leave any groups behind. The third photo down there as well is of a former member of parliament who I speak to, who, as you can see, is delivering a speech in parliament while she's breastfeeding her baby. And that uh, garnered a bit of media attention. 
And so this is my, my secret number one of three secrets, uh, that the legislative framework that exists, like these um, laws on equal pay for equal work, like this uh, supportive childcare system, is very important, although it's not enough on its own. And then I talk about a little how we can work from the, from the grassroots, from the ground up, to be able to maybe influence policy or change policy faster than perhaps elected officials are doing it. One of those ways is to fight for more inclusive laws. This is Ukla Stefania, a non-binary trans woman who I profile in the book, who, who now lives in, in the UK. And they were talking to me about all of the laws that we have recently introduced in Iceland to enshrine the rights of trans people in law that include um, uh, being able to change your gender identity on a passport from a very young age to all kinds of healthcare support through the National Healthcare Service. And that's something that really the community has fought for um, and then Parliament has followed through with legislation. These are four women that I speak to um, who all work in media in Iceland, in the print media, uh, influencers on Instagram, on the, the national television station. The woman on the right, interestingly enough, ran for president in 2012, which I suppose isn't that remarkable these days, except for the fact that when she ran, she took two weeks off during the campaign to give birth to her third child. And her husband or her partner had three children from a previous relationship already, so it was the sixth child in the home. Uh, she was campaigning, very heavily pregnant, had the baby, took two weeks off, and then went back on the stump and finished second in the campaign. And she has a lot of interesting words saying that maybe in many countries she wouldn't have been able to, um, to, to run for president, but she was always asked on all the campaign trails, how are you going to handle it with all of these children and running for president? And when my husband ran for president four years later, and he had five children, he was never asked that question. And at the end of the stops, he used to say, isn't anyone going to ask me as well how I can handle being president with five children? Because I have an answer for that. I can do it. But it shows you that we still need to be working on that a little bit uh, in Iceland as well. And the third point being always wear the gender equality glasses. This is Margaret Laura, Iceland's highest scorer ever on the national soccer team. And Iceland's national sports teams have for a long time earned equal bonuses to, the, to uh, the, their male counterparts. And I know something, for example, that the uh, sports, the soccer teams here have been fighting for for a long time. The message there being that it's really important to always find out you know, how we are consumers of media and culture and sport, and if we're really consuming a, a diversity of material. So here we go, that's the second secret. Needing to work to shift perceptions of equality in many different facets of society. But what can each of us do individually? Push our comfort zones. This is a photo of me a long time ago in Kakum National Park uh, in Ghana, where I had gone on a two month backpacking trip and I hate heights. Like, I really get nervous around them. And this is, it, you can't really see from the photo, but it's, it's very, very high up, or I felt that it was very high up. And so when I finished walking on this canopy walk, I printed out the picture and I wrote at the top of it, you can do it. And I put it on, on my office wall so that every time that I feel like I, I don't, know, don't think I have the confidence to do something or I'm not sure I can do something, I look at that photo and think, well, I did that, that was okay. And for anybody else that's out there, I mean, there's a lot of things everybody's comfort zones are different, but I always encourage people to try to push those comfort zones. Same with following your dreams. Uh, there's a chapter in my book about people who pursue careers like a sea captain, like this woman does. She was the only woman who graduated in her class to be a fishing boat captain. I also speak to a farmer as well who farms about 15 miles from Iceland's most threatening volcano, and that doesn't bother her at all because she says if she worried about an eruption, she'd get nothing done today. And the importance of all being role models. This is a group of women who trained to swim across the English Channel to raise money for charity. Um, you can see them here in the water. This photo is taken in Reykjavik, Iceland's capital. And Reykjavik is the world's northernmost capital city. So it is cold in the sea there. And I went swimming with them one day. And you see they have gloves on, some of them, because it's, it's really, it's not much above freezing temperatures. And they 
wanted to set aside that time for themselves to, to really be role models and show people that it's also important for us, for women to take time for themselves and to set themselves very tough goals as well. So here's the other thing that I think is very important that we can all make a difference and we're all role models, whether that's in our families or our places of worship or our schools or our communities or our business places. And all of you are obviously role models by being here today. And I think it's so important to remind us, and as you've heard so much today already, that it's so important to have our voices heard and to help amplify the voices of others. So Remember I showed you that photo? This is, this is a traditional Icelandic um, costume, by the way, that you wear, for example, if your husband becomes president. I had to, I had to borrow it. So here are some photos of me in, in some of the, the jobs that I've had to do serving uh, as, as first lady. Um, it really happened kind of almost over, overnight. And for me, I found that very strange because I thought, well, there's no handbook on how to be a first lady. So what am I, am I allowed to do this? And I'm allowed to do that. And I want to speak up and use my voice. And I want to talk about gender equality, but am I allowed to do that? Because I only have this platform because my husband did something. There's too much irony in that. Um, and then I thought, you know, well, because there is no handbook and there is no rule book, I might as well make my, my own rule book. And a lot of people have a platform for various reasons, even though, you know, we either have the, the choice to do something with it or not to do something with it, to squander that opportunity. And I thought in this day and age, we need to hear women's voices more, not less. And so I, <laughs> you can clap, it's okay. Thank you. And so I decided that's what I would do. And um, in 2019, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times in which I talked about this, this strange role of the First Lady and the assumptions that come with it, and in which I used the line, um, I'm not my husband's handbag that he can grab as he runs out the door and display silently by his side at public appearances. Because it, I found it very often that my husband would be invited to an event and people would say, well, where's your wife? And you know, I'd never been invited or anything. And it really struck a chord, I think, that piece, because maybe not a lot of people are married to heads of state, but a lot of people, and especially women, often get identified in relation to their, their husband if, for whatever reason, he's better known professionally. And I thought it was important that we need to amplify women's voices overall, not least because in Iceland, where I'm an immigrant, I speak the Icelandic language with an accent. I've moved there as an adult and learned it as an adult. And I think it's very important for people in the country, both immigrants and people who are born there, to know that just because I speak it imperfectly doesn't mean I don't have something important to say. So I try to do that a lot. And you see, we, we go to various events and meet people. The photo on the top right is from uh, a state visit of the Indian president and his wife. And uh, after that visit, I got a very polite letter from a woman uh, who signed her name with her job title, which was um, a master tailor. And she said, uh, I think you're doing a great job, and I, I loved everything you did, but green is definitely not your color. <laughs> so I wear green more now. <laughs> but she was very, I, I, sh I, I shouldn't criticize, she was trying to save me from myself. She was very polite to me. Um, so there's the, yes, that's the New York Times op-ed that I, that I wrote. And I talk a lot about that in the book as well. But that is really my call to action for you here today. And that is to make the most of unexpected opportunities that may come your way. To listen to the others around you. To elevate their voices. To be role models and positive role models. I, t I talk about this word sprakar being this Icelandic word and, and these, these women who, who I speak to in my book are all sprakar, but we're sitting in a room full of sprakar right now. It's, it's nothing that is unique to Iceland and, uh, and something that we can all work towards achieving and doing better to the benefit of us all. And um, I, I, th I think that that's maybe the, the thing that I wanted to leave you with most is, the, is this... Um, impact that and, and effect that we can all have on each other to try to be positive role models, to use our voices, 
to amplify each other and to support each other. So th thank you very much. Thank you for watching the Global Business Women's Pod brought to you by the Greater Houston Women's Chamber of Commerce. We cannot wait to see you next Thursday at 6 p.m. And remember, you can always find us at ghwcc.org.